Well, welcome everyone to Understanding Pre-Painted Metal webinar, which today is being presented by Steelscape. Um, this is another in our series of webinars from Metal Architecture Magazine. I'm Paul Deffenbaugh, I'm the Editorial Director of Metal Architecture, and uh, glad you've joined us today. In a moment here, I'm going to turn things over to Michelle Vondren, our speaker today. Uh, but first, I want to take care of some of the housekeeping issues. Um, so listen up for those of you who are interested in AIA credits or certificates. Um, you'll earn one HSW learning unit for this course, and the recording on that will be handled automatically. So please give us seven business days to process that. And for people looking for certificates, they're going to be handled automatically as well and allow seven business days for that to go through. Um, as we go through the webinar today, we'd love to get your questions. Michelle is a wealth of knowledge, and we're going to want to take advantage of that. So use the panel on the screen to submit questions, and at the end of each section, I'll bring your questions to her, and we'll also take questions at the end. Um, now, uh, let me introduce Michelle, who is going to do our presentation. Michelle Vondren is the Technical Manager for NS Blue Scope Coated Products North America. She graduated from California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry. And she started her career as a research chemist with Morton, which later was BASF, coil coatings, uh, with a focus on polymers. This position also included lab development, as well as lab to production scale up and manufacturing quality and process control. Eventually, Michelle shifted to cool pigmentation, where she brought the first cool coil coatings to market. She was active in the Cool Roof Rating Council and Energy Star Roofing Program. She joined Steelscape as a quality engineer for the Rancho Cucamonga California paint line. And while there, she has held the quality systems manager role and is now technical manager. Uh, Michelle oversees quality systems, a technical service for Blue Scope Coated Products North America, which comprises Steelscape and ASC profiles. And she's an active member of the National Coil Coders Association and sits on the Technical Committee as well as the Zinc Aluminum Coders Association. And um, let me also add that we often turn to Michelle for her expertise in her magazine. So when you're reading articles in our magazine, you will find her thoughts and uh, I'll say brilliance there as well. Michelle, take it away. Thank you, Paul. You always set me up so well. I feel like I have a lot to live up to after your introduction. So thank you for that. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, glad you could join us today. We have a lot to cover um, in our hour. So uh, like Paul said, we will take questions at the end of each section. It's a little easier than waiting till the end because it's so much uh, material. Um, so that'll be our, our goal. Um, Here's the uh, provider information, your credit information, which he already covered, so we'll kind of skip over that. Um, we have four uh, learning objectives today, understanding what, you know, the, the fundamentals of pre-painted metal, what that is and how that process works. We'll talk about the three common paint systems, their differences, um, applications and advantages um, as they apply to the building products world. We'll talk about enhancement features and, and special kinds of paint that can be uh, purchased and used in the architectural world. And then we'll talk about durability, warranties, and performance uh, towards the end. Oops, I lost my um, screen here. Sorry, hang on. I don't know what I clicked. There we go. Um, so what is pre-painted metal? Um, quite self-explanatory, thank goodness, right? So these are uh, rolls of coated steel or aluminum, which we call coils, uh, that have paint applied in a factory setting and, and baked on and cured very quickly and then rolled back up. And then that goes on to be formed into final pieces and parts for a building. But not all pre-painted metal is the same. Uh, there's a lot of differences between the coatings that are available um, and what that finished state looks like, energy efficiencies, visual appeal, lifespans, a lot of different options out there for you to choose between, which gets a bit confusing. Uh, real quick, um, we're gonna focus obviously on exterior building products, uh, architectural products today, but pre-painted metal gets used in a whole slew of things. Uh, probably a lot of items you don't even think about in your day-to-day -day life. So, you know, in the buildings world, obviously metal roofing and siding, standing seam roofing, 
commercial applications, uh, gutters and roof accessories, insulated metal panels, composite panels, tiles. But HVAC is big. Um, most of your appliances these days are made out of pre-painted uh, or coil-coated metal. Cabinetry, hot water heaters, door trims, window trims, um, filing cabinets. I actually just had a, a conversation uh, briefly before this started about, you know, we coat the the little uh, metal hangers on hanging file folders. That's all pre-painted metal done out of big coil. Hmm? That's how it starts. So um, this industry serves a lot of markets hmm? at the end of the day. Hmm? So how is it applied? So our first question, how is paint applied to metal for the majority of building applications? Is it airbrushed? Is it dipped? Is it rolled or brushed on? Hmm? And it is rolled on. Uh, if you can envision like the kind of rollers you use, you know, in your house, but on a giant scale, uh, that's pretty much what we do, except that they're stationary and it's the thing you're painting that is moving um, at the end of the day. Uh, so that's a picture there of what that looks like. This is a coder head. Mm -hmm. The paint goes on these rolls, which then move in and out from the strip and coat it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to understand how this works and the scale of it, um, to the whole process until we get to final products. So this is a kind of a generic uh, schematic of a paint line or a coil line. You can go to the NCCA website and look at this. They also have some really nice videos that I recommend you watch. It's very, uh, it's much more exciting to watch it moving. Uh, so it's a continuous process. Um, the metal is first cleaned uh, and prepped to receive paint, um, and that's. Uh, usually a very large section of the line. Uh, so we do the, the, the cleaning, we put some pre-treatment on there. We then apply usually a primer and then a top coat. Uh, those get baked on separately. Uh, we'll talk about different paint layers later on in the presentation. Uh, we use those big coder heads, those big giant rolls you just saw in the previous picture to do that. Mm -hmm. It's a very fast and dynamic process. So most paint lines are running somewhere between 100 to 700 feet per minute. Mm -hmm. From the time of application of the paint to the strip until it is dried and cured and is being rewrapped into coil form, 15 to 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So very, very quick. Um, not a lot of time to make decisions, difficult to inspect. But by comparison, um, a modern day car with all of its paint is anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours to get one car coated. Mm -hmm. You know, we can, in a matter of 20, 30 minutes, coat enough steel or aluminum to build um, an ungodly amount of buildings or do, um, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of roofs. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of square footage at once. Mm -hmm. um, in the industrial coatings world, which we fall under, this is the thinnest application of paint and the fastest application of paint there is. Mm -hmm. um, the thickness of the paint is less than a piece of paper. It's very, very thin, but obviously has to be very, very durable, has to last a very long time on the outside of a building exposed to all the elements. In the last section, we'll talk in more detail about that. Um, and we're talking warranties anywhere 20 to 40 years at this point. By comparison, your average car warranty for its paint system is only seven to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it gets uh, taken much more better care of usually than a building does. Mm -hmm. So this process, uh, right, has a lot of advantages. It's obviously very fast. You can do a lot of product in a short period of time. Um, it's very tightly controlled and repeatable. So we have very tight specifications on the paint. We can control everything, including color, very, very tightly and get really good repeated outcomes um, uh, between production runs. Very efficient, right? Again, we're only using um, a total amount of paint about 1.4 mils, you know, which is 0.0014 inches. Um, so we're not using a lot of product, uh, which is great. By comparison, most other industrial coatings are two to five mils in thickness. It's a pretty substantial difference. And again, this is all happening before fabrication. So these coatings have to withstand that forming process that it's going to go through later on. So needs to be hard and durable, but also flexible. It has to bend, it has to move, um, but you don't want it to scratch, right? You don't want it to come off the strip. So uh, a lot of science, right? Um, yes, I'm a chemist. I'm not gonna make you do chemistry. We're gonna talk a little chemistry later. There won't be a test on it, I promise you. Um, but there's a lot of science involved um, in this. Um, 
before it makes its way to the final product. Mm -hmm. It's a closed loop system. Uh, so we're capturing all of our VOCs um, and any fumes that come off from this process and regenerating those back in to heat the ovens, mm -hmm. which is nice. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's some limitations. We have to be honest about that. The size of this production, right? These lines are very, very big. Um, most paint lines hold anywhere from 1,500 to 3,500 linear feet of metal at a time from end to end. Um, so very large. So it's built to do large runs of product, not to do little tiny short runs um, of product, which a little bit of a limitation or a disadvantage. Um, right, that efficiency of scale is very important, which is why you can get a little bit of a restriction in color palette. Um, it can be very expensive or there can be very long lead times to do very short runs of, of custom colors. Mm. We prefer to go up and run the same colors for a long period of time mm. um, so we have good efficiencies. Mm. One of the advantages of quality control I mentioned, right, very tightly controlled um, in our our quality control off the line has to simulate the forming that's going to happen later on, right? So we do bins, what we call T-bin tests, uh, to, to look for cracking, both of the substrate or the, the paint itself. We actually will fold the, the sample back on itself very tightly. Uh, we do reverse impact. Again, simulates the stamping process it might go through. We tightly control color. Uh, in a range that the human eye cannot pick up. And that's all done with computers um, and modern equipment. Gloss is important, right? That uh, shininess or glare off the surface is important to design and the look of a building when it's finished. And of course, film thickness is very, very critical. We're controlling that to 0.1 mil, which is very, very tight, um, but very critical for long-term performance and warranty durations. Mm -hmm. Now, while the rest of the presentation is going to focus a bit more on paint, we do want to talk about the substrate underneath. The metal is important. Uh, the two uh, biggest coated steel products we see in this industry is galvanized, hot dip galvanized, or aluminum zinc alloy metallic coatings. And we use these metallic coatings over steel because, as most people know, steel rusts. We don't want it to rust once it gets out in the field. So we've got to put a metallic alloy over it. Um, hot dip galvanized is 100% zinc. Galvalum or zincalum are trade names you'll see out there that are 55% aluminum, 45% zinc formulations. Uh, that aluminum component does have enhanced corrosion protection, with 55% being the optimal ratio. Um, anything else cannot be called galvalum. Uh, that is a trademarked and a licensed uh, technology, which is important to know. So uh, aluminum is inert, right? Provides a protective barrier rather than a sacrificial barrier, which is what the zinc does. So if you combine them together, you're getting both. And again, the BIEC licenses that technology. Uh, Galvalum product typically has um, a 20 or 25 year uh, corrosion warranty that goes with it, whereas galvanized will not. Obviously, some environmental concerns that have to be uh, taken into consideration when you're specking a substrate, um, but your paint can help uh, with that as well. So what is paint? I'm pretty sure everyone on the call has dealt with paint in some form. Um, you either love to paint your house or you hate to paint your house. I think that's usually two camps. But um, <laughs> So we all know what paint is, right? We've all painted at some point in our life as a child or as an adult. It's a liquid designed to go on an a, a surface to give it some kind of attribute, whether it be performance or a visual aesthetic attribute. Um, you also want it to protect the surface normally. Mm -hmm. And like we talked about, there's a lot of ways to do this. Brushing, dipping, spraying, vacuum coating, rolling. Mm -hmm. No limits to that. Mm -hmm. The primary components of any paint, not just the paints we're talking about here today for the architectural world, but really any paint, um, is a resin also known as a polymer. That is the binder or the backbone of the paint system. It um, really pretty much determines the long-term performance characteristics of the paint system are dependent on this resin or binder. Then of course we have pigments because we like color. We don't want to live in a boring white world or a black world. So we uh, like to have color. And then there's solvents, uh, you know, your house paints, that's water. They're all water-based. In our world, they are actual, um, 
hydrocarbon solvents that we use so that you can handle it in liquid form and get it from a drum onto a coater or into a pan or wherever it needs to go and then you burn that off to cure it and then there's additives uh, these are um, we, we joke sometimes that this is you know the magic dust the magic stuff we put in paint to to fine-tune its performance characteristics that could be flow it could be um, actual UV blockers to give it protection out in, in high UV environments. It could be uh, powders that help reduce, reduce uh, glare and gloss on the surface, a whole host of things. So again, this is kind of a cheat sheet of those summaries and, and what it brings to the table. So the resin, the polymer, again, is your primary physical and chemical properties, durability, hardness, flexibility, adhesion, gloss. Uh, corrosion performance, uh, humidity performance, all of that's going to be from uh, the resin. Pigments, while very important to color and final look, are also providing corrosion resistance, water resistance. Um, you want to hide the surface that it's going over so it looks good. That's important. And then, of course, solvent is really what's important to us as the coder or the applicator uh, side of this is can you handle it? Does it flow out properly? Um, is it stable, right? You don't want to open a drum of paint and have all of your pigments sitting at the bottom, right? It's got to stay in solution. This is the percentage breakdown of those components on average, right? Again, so pretty evenly distributed between your resin, your solvent, and your pigment, and then a little bit of additives by weight at the end. And of course, all your solvents burn off in the curing process and are not on the final product. They are our final product has no VOCs. So how do you know what paint to get, right? I mean, I've talked to there's all these options. Um, for building products, typically you're trying to balance durability and hardness, but with the ability to be formed, right? So that flexibility versus hardness. You got to get the right balance of resins. Um, know what your application, your end product is. So you can dial that in. And then, of course, cost and warranty. Um, most of our products, though, fall here where this red bar is, a little bit to the harder side of what's available, uh, which is going to give you good gloss retention, good mar resistance. It's not going to chip or crack, but still has enough flexibility to make a final panel or part on a building. Pigments, um, this is the fun part, right? This is the uh, beautiful, colorful part of what we do. Uh, pigments are insoluble solid particles. They're very finely ground up and dispersed um, with the resin when you're making paint. You want your pigment to, quote, wet out, right? So you want it to wet out and attach to that resin uh, very well and uh, in a very even manner. There's two kinds of pigments that we work with, organic and inorganic. Your inorganic pigments are usually metal oxides, uh, mined out of the earth, and then maybe enhanced in a manufacturing setting. Very, very stable. Uh, they're gonna be more of your earth tones, a little bit duller, reds, yellows, greens, browns, and blacks, versus your organic pigments, which are your bright primary colors, your reds, your blues, your greens, your violets. Um, organic pigments, while beautiful and have a nice clean color, aren't very durable uh, out in full sunlight. So you have to balance the inorganic pigments with a little bit of organic to get your shading and your color. Uh, the paints we're talking about today will be primarily in inorganic pigments uh, in their final formulation. Mm -hmm. Color, right? We spend a lot of time on color uh, in our world. It's the eye's perception, right, of wavelengths of visible light bouncing off of a surface. Uh, we do measure this numerically with a, it's called an LAB number. It's the light scale, the black white scale, the blue green scale, the, the red yellow scale. Um, we do read almost all colors numerically with a computer. We control this into a plus or minus 0.5 range. The human eye doesn't usually pick up color difference to get to a one unit change in color. So, again, tighter than what the human eye can usually pick up. Layers of paint. We don't do just one layer of paint uh, for a lot of reasons. We um, almost, so this is a cross section of what the strip would look like. You've got your steel, coated steel in the middle here. 
you're going to have a very thin layer of pretreatment that preps the surface for good adhesion to the paint. You're going to put a primer on. Our primers are um, provide a lot of corrosion resistance. They also provide the bite or the surface for the top coat to adhere to and link to when you apply it. Then you have your top coat. Then you may have a clear coat on the exterior side, maybe not. Um, the back side of the strip, even though it's not necessarily going to be exposed in the final application, is also coated uh, with primer and what we call a backer coat or a bottom side coat. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One, for protection. Um, of the surface and corrosion protection as well. But when you wrap this product back up in coil form, uh, if one side is still metal and the other side is painted, it's very prone to marring and scratching that painted surface. The bare uncoated side will leave defects and damage on the coated side. So we always want to make sure that there's a coating on both sides when we recoil it back up. So, I think that's the end of uh, our first section. If there's any questions, we'll take a few minutes. Hi, Michelle, we don't have any questions yet, but I have a question. And, and yep. just a clarification for me is, is the clear coat the same thing as a paint film? Am it I is. It, I mean, we refer to it as a clear, but it's a paint that just doesn't have pigments in it um, at the end of the day. And actually, it's actually a misnomer. There are pigments in there. They're just transparent to the human eye. Um, most of our clear coats have UV blockers um, built into them. So they look transparent, but they're actually blocking UV rays. It's like a sunscreen uh, for paint, really. Um, so there are pigments in there. We just can't see them. Okay. Uh, and, and one question just did come in real quickly about how you protect the cut edges of metal. Yep. Uh, there's a couple different ways to do that. Um, one is you know, most of the final, a lot of the final formed parts, roofing and siding that get used will have a hemmed or rolled edge so that that cut edge is not exposed in the final part. Um, you can also cover it with trim or battens. Uh, there are some field applied coatings you can apply as well once it's installed on the edge to give it some extra protection. But one of the benefits of, of properly metallic coated steel is that that metallic coating is protecting that cut edge as well. Um, so you don't get corrosion or edge creep too much on those cut edges. But um, we do recommend, especially we'll talk about a little bit more like marine environments. If it's going to be kind of a harsher environment, the recommendation is, is that you use a panel um, that does not have an exposed cut edge after it's installed is the best practice. Uh, great. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Continue on. Okay. Uh, now we're going to get into the specific paint systems and types that we use. So common paint systems and their differences. Can you name the three common paint systems used in the building's world? They are silicone, modified polyester, polyester, and fluorocarbon. Mm -hmm. Um, those, there's others, but those are the three we're going to focus on today. They are the vast majority of the architectural space um, that gets used. Oops, I went backwards, sorry. So here we are. SMPs, right, are enhanced polyesters. Uh, fluorocarbons, PVDF, polyvinyl dean fluoride, or Kynar 500, Hylar 5000. Um, those are all the same name for the same product because at some point in our industry, we decided it would be better to have six names for one product than one. So it gets a little confusing. I apologize on behalf of the coil coating world uh, that we have not simplified this, but um, yeah, fluorocarbons go by a range of, of names. And the, these are the ones you'll see most commonly. Uh, these are kind of ranked here from good to best. Um, we will talk about. Polyesters are uh, really kind of a workhorse of the industrial coatings world. Uh, they're cost effective. They can be formulated to do a lot of different things. Uh, very, very versatile. Uh, wide range of flexibility and hardness, wide range of colors and glosses. Um, use polyesters everything from interior non-critical applications to exterior buildings. Most typical applications are uh, 
metal roofing, gutters, downspouts, so your rainwater goods are typical polyesters, light agricultural and commercial, appliance wrappers and interior coatings are almost always going to be polyesters. And the chemistry of a polyester, polyester denotes a type of chemistry. Um, I'm sure most of you, a lot of us are probably wearing polyester clothing or clothing that has some polyester component to it. That's how versatile polyester chemistry is, right? Is you can make everything from clothing to an industrial coating with it. Um, so kind of endless options for polyesters. Silicone modified polyesters, or SMPs for short, are polyesters that have had some silicone reacted into its backbone or to its resin. What this does is gives you a big step up in uh, weatherability and durability for an exterior um, application. Much Michelle, we just lost your audio. Maybe it's just me. Improved resistance to shock and fade, but you still have a nice wide range of colors and glosses. Primarily. Again, fluorocarbons go by a lot of different names, um, but it's the same polymer, the same chemistry at the end of the day, and it has superb performance long term. Very chemically resistant, has great shock and fade resistance, uh, holds up well in aggressive environments, industrial or marine environments, but is also very formable, very flexible. And the fluorocarbon or the PBDF molecule is only one atom different than Teflon. So that's the family it lives in. And a lot of people can identify with the durability of Teflon, right? We're very familiar with that in cookware. Um, so great, great long-term performance. Mm -hmm. So quick uh, cheat sheet on that. Mm -hmm. um, again, polyesters can be good to better, wide range of options for them. They're very cost-effective. The warranty on polyesters can range from none to moderate, uh, like moderate being 20, 25 years, limited to good durability long-term, uh, you know, wide range of colors and options. The AMA specification that uh, applies to it is 2603 or less, um, and maybe 621. Mm -hmm. SMPs, again, a bit, bit of a step up, mm -hmm. moderate price point, longer warranty durations, medium to high uh, durability uh, out in the world and used for a wide range of construction applications, residential and commercial both. Again, good selection of color, good gloss options on this. And then our PVDF, the fluorocarbon, the Kynar, the best, right? It's kind of been the Cadillac for years uh, of paint systems, although the gap between PVDF and SMP has shrunk considerably um, in the last 20 years, but it's still the long, some of the longest warranties longest durability, but the highest cost, primarily reserved for high-end architectural and commercial uh, projects. You will see it spec right, in the architectural specs, they will call out PVDF or Kynar on projects. Excellent chalk and fade resistance. So things to um, consider, uh, right, is not all polyesters are the same. So if someone says, oh, I need a polyester, there needs to be a lot of follow-up questions to that. Mm -hmm. um, the differential, again, between high-end polyester and SMPs can be marginal this day and age. And a lot of that has to do with the pigmentation. If they're using all inorganic, top-of-the-line pigments, performance is going to be very close. Mm -hmm. But PBDF is still up there as far as UV resistance and optimal exterior durability. That Kynar 500 and Hylar 5000 name are registered trademarks. You have to be licensed uh, as a paint company to call your product that and use that resin. And it's gotta be 70% uh, of the overall resin composition has to be the, the PBDF to call it that. <laughs> Otherwise you can't use that trade name. Uh, any questions on paint types? I know uh, we, we have one questions. quick question here. Uh, thanks, Michelle. We have one quick question about uh, paints used in coastal environments and, and how they're coated differently. And, and you may address this later on, but could you talk about that a little bit? It's the next section. So thank you for being a bit psychic. <laughs> yeah. So no, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it in in some detail here in about two slides. 
and, and I'm going to follow up with another question uh, somebody asking about uh, fees, FEVE. The is FEVE, a right? So FEVE is a fluorocarbon technology as well. It's kind of, um, yeah, it, it's a very high-end system. It is in the fluorocarbon family, so it's a cousin to PVDF and Teflon. Um, typically, it's used for clear coat, semi-transparent. We also use it for very bright primary colors. So the PVDF resin itself is actually a milky white color. So it's very hard to get high gloss and bright colors with it because it's bringing this milky white undertone uh, to what it's used in. FEVE is clear. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, and, and can have very high gloss. So we see FEVE for like, 70 80 percent gloss and higher very shiny surfaces and for very bright primary colors historically um I'm, the things that come to mind for me are we used to run here um pizza hut red for their signage and that was all feve mm -hmm. uh, technology that bright pure red color high gloss um, gas station signage and canopies right are very bright primary high gloss colors and we see it used there a lot um, but there are some other niche markets uh, for it as, as well semi-transparent uh, products are often feve because uh, it has great performance great durability uh, like its cousin pvdf it holds up very very well um, all right uh, thanks thanks we've got a couple of other questions but i'm going to let you go on uh, okay um, so yeah, our next section is enhancements for pre-painted uh, metal. So what important building considerations can influence the type of pre-painted metal specified? And these are kind of the, just a few of a very long list, uh, but the ones we see most often, proximity to salt water, right? That's a highly corrosive environment. So some special stuff has to go on. We're gonna answer your question about marine paint systems here shortly. Uh, building energy efficiency, right? Does it need to be cool? Does it have to have cool properties? Does it need to be energy star rated? Um, the desired color, um, do you want some kind of special effect with the color or the pattern of color? The visibility of the roof surface is important. You know, you don't want a lot of glare uh, annoying your neighbors. Um, you know, there are restrictions on glare and sheen around airports because you don't certainly don't want a pilot not able to see what they're doing as they're flying, right? They don't want to be blinded by a metal roof. So that's important. Um, the use of other materials with metal needs to be discussed. There's some uh, things you can and can't do there. You know, exposed eaves, cut edges, which already came up. So the ones we're really going to focus on here today are uh, specialty pigments, micas and metallics. We're going to talk about clear coats, talk about marine and industrial enhancements and locations, graffiti resistance, cool roof pigments or cool pigmentation, textures, and then prints and imagery. So the micas and metallics are exactly what they sound like, right? These are the shiny, sparkly, pearlescent pigments uh, that are very, very popular in the commercial architectural space. A lot of silvers and coppers and bronzes and um, you know sparkly grays. Historically, these were actual metal flakes, um, which then also required a clear coat. But over the years, we've seen more and more formulations with micas, which give the same look but have very good durability without a clear coat. But we still use the term metallic in the industry, so you get that light catching, sparkling effect. And then there's of course uh, color shifting pigmentations fall in this family as well. Not a lot of buildings done with this. You see it more on cars, but um, you know this is something that maybe looks green from one viewing angle, but as you move around, it shifts to a purple or another color. And those are available, and we can run them uh, on our paint lines. Mm -hmm. One big warning on metallics and micas is they are directional. They are batch sensitive. We cannot guarantee an exact color match from run to run with this kind of pigmentation. So. If you're doing a large project that calls out one of these paints, you kind of need to run everything at once, or you need to batch it by viewing plane of the building, right? So it goes on a different viewing plane and you don't see a color differential. Um, but they're directional is what these um, pictures show here. So if you accidentally turn a panel 
180 to all the others, you'll see this color shift visually that occurs. So we always have to caution our panel manufacturers um, to make sure they've got everything oriented correctly. We actually go so far as typically putting directional arrows on the back of this material. So when it gets to a job site, they know what direction it's supposed to go. Here we're gonna talk about extreme environments and our, our marine question that came up. So yeah, pre-painted can be modified for pretty severe uh, environments, marine being um, a big one for coastal or industrial applications. Usually what happens is you're gonna take that primer layer and you're gonna increase it considerably. You're gonna run it at, at two to three times its normal thickness, right? So that's gonna give you a lot more corrosion protection for that metal underneath. You're also most likely gonna to have to apply a clear coat so these end up being three or four coat systems um, at the end of the day when they go out the door. Uh, this allows for a warrantable finish that can go near salt water or in an industrial application. Now the definition of marine or coastal does vary by paint supplier. So you have to watch the language and the specs a little bit, but typically it's a thousand feet to like half a mile, sometimes a mile distance from salt water. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're gonna be designing or doing a project near salt water, it's always advisable to have that conversation early in the planning and design phase with the uh, panel supplier and the coating supplier to make sure everyone understands where it's going, you understand what you need on that product for long-term performance. Mm -hmm. Clear coats can do other things besides improve um, UV resistance and corrosion resistance. There's uh, graffiti resistant clear coats and coatings that are available, which do a couple things. One, it's very hard to get anything to stick to it, like spray paint or any other kind of graffiti that might get used. But then it also cleans up very, very well um, without damaging the surface. So uh, we do see that. And then you can also increase hardness and more resistance with a clear coat. Uh, food staining prevention, right? Their food contact is a very specialized uh, market that, you know, that coating has to have special properties. And again, the graffiti resistance. Mm -hmm. You, I, we talked earlier about clear is not truly being clear, right? We call them clear, but they're not really clear. Um, the UV blockers and stuff that they contain impart a slight yellow tint to them. Uh, for a reason, right? Because we don't want them completely transparent. So, you know, if you're going to use a clear coat over a, a darker color, you might visually see the difference. Um, and you can see here the white on the top. Uh, the panel on the left is just standard primer and top coat. Uh, the one in the middle has a thick film primer added. And then the one on the right is thick film primer, color coat, and clear coat. And you can see in the lighter colors that it has shifted a little yellow. But in the darker colors, you really can't tell, um, you know. And so unless the clear coated stuff is going to go against non clear coated material, it's really not an issue. You're not going to see that color variance, but it's just something people need to be aware of. that It does have a little bit of a yellow undertone to it. Backers, we talked about backers earlier and the need for them um, is kind of multifold, right? It's a bit overlooked. Most product has kind of a standard off white or gray backer on it. Um, but you can really do any color. We can coat both sides of the strip uh, with a full coat of paint if you want. I mean, kind of anything's possible, but um, we try to have a nice consistent backer on there, especially if it's gonna be like an even or an overhang where someone might see it, it's viewable, you want that to look decent and be consistent. Um, but again, it's really to protect uh, the top side finish while in transit and coil form, and then also to give you a boost on corrosion performance. Cool colors, right? So we talked about cool pigmentation, energy efficient uh, pigmentation. This stuff came into the market in the early 2000s. So these are inorganic pigments that have been slightly modified to reflect in the infrared region of the spectrum, which is where heat generation comes from. So they're altered both chemically and physically to reflect IR differently but to still look the same color in the visual in visible wavelength range. Um, so you get a cooler, darker color that still looks dark. Um, yeah. 
any paint system can be mod modified to be cool because it comes from the pigment. It doesn't matter what the uh, resin or the polymer is. Does minimize heat buildup, reduces cooling costs in hot climates, mitigates heat island effect. Um, a lot of building codes, especially out here in the West, um, have you know this kind of built into their building codes now. Mm -hmm. Lead, of course, has a cool roof component to it as well. Mm -hmm. Most of you are probably familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's some terminology here that gets people a little hung up sometimes. So, you know, what is cool? Well, we measure it kind of in three different ways. There's a solar reflectance value. That's the amount of solar radiation that's reflected off the surface. There's emissivity, which is the amount of heat a surface can dissipate away from itself after it gets hot. You take those two values into a very long, nasty mathematical calculation, uh, and you end up with solar reflective index. Uh, which is what LEED and other building codes and, and bodies are using now to define cool, right? Is that SRI value. Uh, the higher, the better, typically. Cool Roof Rating Council is kind of the third party that keeps everyone honest on that, and you can rate and, and list your products. And then there's the aged value, right? That three-year age value, right? You want it to start cool, but you want it to stay cool too, right? You don't want that property to drop off. And that is one huge advantage that coated metal has. Because these paints have such great longevity and they don't change color or properties over time, um, these initial cool properties stay for a very, very long time, as opposed to asphalt roofing um, and some field applied coatings, their SRI values tend to drop off in that three to five year range quite significantly, while metal does not. Again, lead, we talked about lead, um, right? They steep slope, low slope, two and 12, less or greater than. Uh, low slope, flat roof pretty much has to be white. It's pretty hard to get an initial SRI value of 82 with anything other than a white. So that limits that. Steep slope now moved up a few years ago to 39. Um, that kind of eliminates your darker uh, colors, but you can still get some nice mid-tones and lighter in that range without too much effort. Now, we also have to talk about um, gloss and sheen. I talked about glare, right? So gloss and sheen describe the visible shine or reflection off the surface. We typically measure that at a 60 degree angle off the surface. That's gloss. Sheen is measured at an 85 degree um, viewing angle. High gloss sheen results in a very high glare or shiny surface. Low gloss, low sheen will have a very flat matte appearance. Um, and we're seeing a lot more uh, counties, cities requesting low gloss, low sheen, especially on residential, right? Because they don't want to annoy people around them with glare off of a metal roof. So um, it's becoming important. And they use this light reflectance value to define that LRV, which is the total amount of reflected light um, rather than these specific viewing angles. Now, a lot of folks confuse light reflectance with solar reflectance that we just talked about on cool, two different things, mm -hmm. um, and pretty much unrelated to each other. Mm -hmm. So if someone says, well, it needs to be low reflectance, there needs to be a follow-up question of, well, what type of reflectance? Light reflectance, solar reflectance, you know, what are you talking about? Because they're not the same. Mm -hmm. And again, movement in this. Um, these two samples um, here uh, formed panels are actually technically the same color, normal gloss, low gloss. And that's the difference it makes to the human eye in perception of color as well, right? It looks like a whole different color even though it's the same. And we achieve this a couple different ways. Um, there's flattening agents, that'd be the additives of the paint I talked about, the magic stuff we put in. Texturizing the surface, right, breaks up how that light reflects off the surface. So micro texture, um, micro particles that give it, you know, on a molecular level, a very rough surface um, help with that. Mm -hmm. And again, gloss and sheen, LRV and SRI are not all the same thing. These are different components that can be measured separately and specified separately from one another. Mm -hmm. So here you can see that <clears throat> the LRV. Um, is the same for these two. 
but look at the gloss difference, 0.9 versus 21. That's a huge difference. Sheen, 3.8 versus 25, huge difference. But look, their cool properties, their solar reflectance properties, almost very much the same, even though they look so different from one another. The other things that we can do are um, patterns, right? It doesn't have to be a solid color. Uh, so this is imagery, print coats that we do. Um, these are achieved a couple different ways, either with special rolls on the line. There's now digital printing, basically like big giant uh, printers you would use for paper that you can print on metal with. Um, development's relatively short. You can modify existing rolls to do this. Use the same paint systems uh, that you do for the solid color. And you can come up with patterns like this, kind of these patina looks, striped looks. We have wood, wood grain patterns are pretty popular as well. Mm -hmm. This is the digital printing, right? So you can actually get like a photograph type image. Mm -hmm. um, and this is on steel, mm -hmm. what it looks like. Um, you can also do laminates, right? Where you're actually taking an image that's been printed on you know, a piece of plastic or paper and then you adhere it to the steel surface as well. Um, see this more for interior. It doesn't have great long-term performance outside. Um, and then the digital printing has really gained ground the last few years. We're seeing more and more of that. Um, and the durability has improved mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, into that section. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michelle. I, a couple of questions. Uh, one of our attendees is asking for clarification on why UV rays don't affect the PDDF paint system. It has to do with its molecular bonds. So it's a carbon floor, fluorine bond, uh, which is incredibly stable and very difficult to break apart. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of not impacted by UV. Uh, the polyester bonds are a bit weaker. Um, that's typically a carbon oxygen, carbon hydrogen bond uh, that's easier to break down. Mm -hmm. um, so it's that molecular level that gives it its, its good performance. Um, carbon fluorine chemistry is some of the most stable chemistry on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Uh, and another person is asking about uh, a, a coating that could be an appropriate coating that could be made like a green screen panel that uh, you go down to gray planting bed. Okay, I didn't catch all that. So I caught screen panel and then not the last part. Okay, sorry, echo. Uh, a rain screen panel uh, okay. that may go down to the grade and be near a planting bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you do have to be careful there, right? And that kind of, um, you could, any of these paint systems would work for that. Mm -hmm. um, you do have to be careful that it's not going to be embedded or covered with soil. Mm -hmm. um, that becomes a corrosion issue for the substrate. But um, yeah, all of these paint systems are considered inert, non-leaching. Mm -hmm perfectly good to use water off of it for non-potable mm -hmm. applications. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. You just don't uh, want it to be in the soil or to stay wet continuously. You're going to have corrosion issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much. Those are the questions we have for now. Okay. Uh, last section, we're going to talk about durability issues, performance, and warranties that are out there. Mm -hmm. So what are the three common elements that are warranted uh, on pre- painted metal. Mm -hmm. um, well, you'll have your metallic coating corrosion performance. We talked about the Galvalon product. That 55% aluminum product will have its own warranty just for the substrate. But if you talk about the paint system itself, it's going to be typically warranted for film integrity, chalk, and fade. Film integrity means is it going to stick long term, right? Is it going to stay on the substrate year after year? Mm -hmm. um, and these range anywhere from five years, 40 years. I think we're starting to see some 50-year uh, warranties out there now. Uh, again, they cover excessive chalking, excessive color fade, and delamination of the top coat of the primer from the substrate. Um, these failures are often due to improper application or installation, a poor paint formula. Uh, maybe the coater didn't have very good quality control um, when they made that coil. And then there's environmental factors. Um, and again, the difference between the paint types can be quite a bit. Um, 
put this example in here. This is an example that's been around forever, this blue building in Japan, uh, 1981. They put it all up and they, they purposely put different types of paint along this same wall, mm -hmm. right? And it all started the same color. Mm -hmm. And then in 1995, you can see the difference. You can see that the Kine R500, the fluorocarbon, kind of looks exactly like it did when it first went up and everything else has faded in comparison. Um, again, the differential between especially S&P and Kynar has shrunk considerably. They don't fade nearly as bad as they used to, but um, this is why it's nice. This is another, we'll talk about a little bit here, but it's why you don't want to mix paint systems on an installation either, because you're going to get differential performance uh, over time. So chalking, what is excessive chalking? That's one that most people are not familiar with, and it's what it sounds like. It is a chalky surface. So it's a degradation of the resin system over time. It breaks into smaller components and actually comes loose from the surface of the paint, uh, along with some pigmentation. And it usually takes on this white appearance. And yeah, you can run your hand over it and your hand is covered in this white powder, uh, predominantly caused by UV rays. Again, the high-end paint systems such as PVDS and high-end S&Ps will have warranties of 20 years plus against chalking. This can actually be measured. There's an ASTM technique for it. You rate it on a scale of zero to 10. The higher the number, the better. Mm -hmm. um, so a 10 would be no chalk. Um, an eight chalk rating would be virtually none or hardly any that could be uh, detected. Mm -hmm. Color fade, pretty self-explanatory. I think we're all really familiar with this, um, right? It fades. We measure it by what's called delta E, which is a color unit measurement, um, numerical value that represents total color change. Human eye can detect this between 0.5 and 1 unit. Uh, the PVDF systems typically have the tightest uh, color fade that's allowed, usually 5 units or less. So 5 units of color fade or less over a anywhere from a 30 to 40 year time period, which is not a lot of color fade. Um, I wish these photographed better. These are uh, some samples we have that show initial color on the top, five units of color fade in the middle, and then seven units of color fade um, is the last one. Mm -hmm. Polyesters and S&Ps are usually five or seven units of color fade, and they typically differentiate between a vertical uh, and a horizontal installation. Mm -hmm. uh, so you gotta read the fine print a little bit here. Here is a beautiful example of this lovely house, this is I think down in Alabama, um, where they mixed PVDF with polyester on a roof. And the PVDF is looking great, polyester not so much. And I think this is about 15, 18 years old mm -hmm. when that photo was taken. Mm -hmm. Delamination, film integrity, this is a big one. This is the toughest one for those of us in uh, my world to figure out why it failed. Mm -hmm. Right, this is loss of paint adhesion to either the substrate or between the primer and the top coat. You can get visible bubbling, peeling, chipping, cracking, or a complete loss of paint. A lot of possible root causes for this. Um, could be low film, could have been incorrect pretreatment, could have been inadequate curing, could be a compatibility issue. It could simply be damage at the time of installation or damage that has occurred while the roof was in service, either during cleaning, um, the glacial effect, places where there's snow load that doesn't have snow stops and that snow slides down these panels will leave scratches uh, that then open up over time and you get loss of paint. Um, so it's a very difficult one after the fact to know exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. There's some other failures that occur that aren't warranted that need to be talked about. Um, and this is due to improper installation not using the right compatible building materials with the metal. Um, so dissimilar metals, galvanic corrosion, incompatible materials um, like sealants uh, can cause damage and corrosion. Swarf or metal filings that are left from cutting or drilling fastener holes that are left on the surface rust and leave a stain behind. Wet stack is corrosion that can occur when the panels are in the bundles on the ground still before they're installed. You get moisture in between them and it starts a corrosion process uh, that can damage the paint finish. And then uh, something else that comes up, it's not a failure, but um, I like to mention it because architects are somewhat familiar with it, is oil canning. Uh, light gauge metal is prone to having a little bit of a buckle or a shape 
especially in flat architectural panels. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a quantitative measurement for it. It just is or isn't. So dissimilar metals, this is a really important one. We talked about marine environments. This is really comes into effect when you're in a marine or corrosive environment. So it's metal to metal contact, but they're dissimilar metals. Um, right, this is a very generic galvanic scale here. Let, more active metals on the top, less active metals on the bottom. If you're in a corrosive environment, and it can be uh, corrosive air, corrosive moisture touching it. Um, the further away two metals are on this list that are in contact with a corrosive atmosphere around it, the more active metal is going to sacrifice itself for the more noble metals. So what we have here is a stainless steel lighting fixture recessed through painted galvalum with no barrier between them. So they're in direct contact. This home was about 300 feet off the surf break outside of San Diego. So highly corrosive environment. Mm -hmm. um, what's happening, it looks like the paint's bubbling up, but what's happening is the zinc alum, galvalum underneath is corroding away. So there's nothing left for the paint to stick to, mm -hmm. uh, which is why the paint, it, these claims almost always come in as a, my paint is failing. Well, the paint's failing because the substrate's failing. Um, but what you see is the paint failure first. Mm -hmm. Um, the other things that are uh, problematic out there is direct contact with concrete. Uh, you got to have a, a water uh, vapor or barrier in there because you'll get moisture from the concrete that leaches into the galvalum surface and causes corrosion underneath the paint. You can see here that this paint is starting to bubble up. Ooh. This is the same house, by the way, that had the lighting fixture on the previous slide. Um, and then wood, treated wood. Wood is often treated with copper compounds. Uh, which are really not compatible with painted metal. So if you have a situation where a wood deck or some kind of wood framing is in direct contact or can leach water onto the, the painted metal, you're going to get corrosion. So this is a house in Hawaii. Uh, the corrosion was only occurring under this wood deck right here. As soon as you got past the edge of this wood deck, the metal was fine. And it had to do with the treatment that was leaching out of the, uh, the deck above it. Swarf. The metal filings that are left from cutting or, or piercing uh, panels, discs to saw, just got to make sure you wipe them off and get them off the surface um, because that the little particles start to rust, which makes the uh, owner think that their metal panels are rusting, but they're not. It's on the surface. Uh, but that stain that it leaves can be really hard to remove after the fact, um, sometimes impossible. So now you have an aesthetic issue. Performance is going to be fine. It just doesn't look good. Um, and this sample, this dark uh, gray down here, this is kind of the worst swarf I think I've ever seen in my career. I mean, it's like they were piling it on there. I don't even know what they were doing. But this is all permanent red staining that won't come off. Uh, there's lots of technical guides around this, how to avoid it, what to do to clean it up that are available. Right, Use a power saw with a metal cutting blade. Do your cutting and stuff on the ground or away from installed panels cover the area you're working and then sweep up afterwards. Mm -hmm. Wet stack, this is corrosion in the bundles that I talked about, it can happen in coil form too. So um, if you have panels or coil, uh, so there's very little air gap in between, right? They're stacked very tightly together, but a little bit of moisture even, even from the air or actual rain or precipitation gets in between there and it can't dry. It, starts this corrosion cycle um, underneath the paint that presents as these little tiny blisters. Uh, and if you were to scrape those back, there would be a layer of white oxide or white rust underneath the paint on top of the steel. So there's a lot of guidelines around how to store it so this does not happen. And here's oil canning. Again, not a paint failure, but something I think needs to be talked about um, in the metal architectural world. So it's this waviness or buckling that you see here. And uh, you can actually go up there and pop it, right? That's why it's called oil canning is because you can touch it and it moves and makes a popping noise. Um, stresses in the base material, not having a good substrate can be a factor. Misaligned panels can be a factor. Um, not allowing for thermal expansion and contraction can lead to this. But there's there are some solutions. So um, adding styration. So this is the same 
panel with and without styrations on the same roof. You can see the buckling on the left and how it goes away with these light styrations in the forming, right? Dissipates that. Uh, embossed surfaces, lower gloss surfaces won't show it. It's still there, you just don't see it as much. Uh, you want to always make sure you're getting tension leveled steel as well, which is the norm for the most part. So how do we avoid these failures, right? We want a product that lasts. Specifying the right paint. Ooh, we just talked about paint system. You want to make sure you have the right paint for the application. Use a reputable coil coater. Mm -hmm. Don't mix batches unless you have to. Um, a reputable uh, panel manufacturer, right, is going to know how to package this stuff to get it to the job site. They're going to know how to make their panels appropriately. They should have a lot of good installation bulletins and tech bulletins on how to handle it and clean it up afterwards. A good installer, right? Um, this is one thing we find, especially in residential, uh, not a lot of roofers are familiar or comfortable working with metal. Mm -hmm. So you need to find someone that's got some experience and knows how to handle it, store it, get it up on the roof without damaging it. Knows what fasteners to use, knows what other materials can be used with it and can't. Mm -hmm. And then uh, frequent roofer wall surface cleaning. Um, and there are guidelines for this as well. I like to go back to a car analogy because we can all relate. Um, you know, you don't own a car for 10 years and not clean it or wash it. I mean, maybe some people do, but most people don't. It's the same, same with your building or your roof, right? It at least needs to be washed off once a year periodically, or it's not gonna look very good. You know, you don't get to have your car for eight years with bird droppings and everything else on it accumulated and then take it back to the dealer and go, well, my paint's failing. Well, your paint's failing because you never took care of it, right? That's not a valid warranty claim. Hmm? Got to do some maintenance. Hmm? And then some kind uh, of just sort of a caution is to read your warranties closely. A lot of people kind of read the first paragraph and don't go any further. Hmm? Um, so you want to really understand what's being warranted, right? They're not all the same. They will call out headlines like lifetime or 30-year warranty. Well, but what's being warranted for 30 years, right? How much chalk is allowed? How much color fade is allowed? Um, and that duration in the header is usually just for the film integrity. The duration for the chalk and fade might be something else. Um, and there's going to be a lot of exclusions and conditions that have to be met for the warranty to be in effect. So you want to read through it. As boring as it is, right, if you've got insomnia, read some paint warranties. Um, but you do want to understand what you're getting and what that warranty actually covers. The definition of marine should be in there, right? If you're near the coastline, make sure you're not in violation of their marine definition. You don't need a different paint system. Hmm? Um, so, yeah, all the stuff I just said. Um, but really, at the end of the day, what we have found is that as long as it performs uniformly, right, if the color fade over 20 years is uniform, most people aren't going to notice and not going to care. Um, you kind of only get fade claims when it's good in one spot and bad in another. Um, but you need to make sure that that's covered. Um, if it's unequal exposure to light, your warranty is probably not going to be in effect. Mm -hmm. And then again, rain applications typically have to be pre approved by the manufacturer. And they like to have that discussion as early in the process as possible. Mm -hmm. That's the end of that section. If there's any questions on that section in particular, we can take them now. I know we've run a bit over. I do have some questions, but let's just kind of wrap things up. Do you have a little bit more you want to go through and then we'll take them at the end? No, this is it. This is the last page. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I thank you, Michelle. It was, uh, it was fabulous. Um, a couple of questions, and, and going back to the PBD uh, paint system, um, a clarification about why all colors and shades aren't achievable in the PBD paint system. Yeah, it has to do with that polymer itself is um, kind of a milky white color. Um, so that so when you start to formulate color around that, you're starting with this white base rather than a clear base. Um, so it kind of imparts some color in and of itself to the final formulation. But it's, um, I mean, it can be overcome with certain pigmentations. It might influence the warranty a little bit, but gloss wise, it's, it, it's that milkiness 
and it's inherent gloss by itself that limits its final gloss uh, in a paint formula, uh, which is why then you need to go to an FEVE or an SMP or a polyester that can achieve a high high gloss if you need it, because uh, those resins are clear, uh, mostly clear. They're transparent. Um, they might have a slight yellowish tint to them, but you can see through them, right? If I poured a glass of PVDF resin, you can't see through it. If I pour a glass of polyester resin, I can see right through it. Um, might not be crystal clear, but you can see through it. Um, so that's what affects the final gloss and color formulas. Right. Um, and, and that's, one of the attendees is asking about uh, Kynar finishes and says that you know they're sold with warranties from 20 to 40 years. Are they all the same finishes? I mean, it says Kynar. I assume that's kind of what the person's asking. Yeah. Um, yes and no. So while all the major paint suppliers make a Kynar product, the pigmentation that they use might be different. And you might remember I mentioned that the Kynar, to call it Kynar, it has to be, the resin after it has to be 70% PVDF. That leaves a 30% component that's up to the paint supplier to do with as they please. So, um, and that can affect the performance. Um, of that final paint formula is how good is that 30% of this other resin that they're using? And it's it's almost always an acrylic. It has to be an acrylic, which we didn't talk about. I'm gonna get into some chemistry here, bear with me. Um, PVDF resin is only soluble in an acrylic resin. So to make it liquid, because it's, it's solid by itself, you have to make it into a liquid, you have to have this 30% acrylic resin to dilute it in. That acrylic component is in the final paint formula. So it is bringing some performance attributes to the table. Um, yeah, so that's why you might see variations in warranty, but I find that warranty durations typically are just a supplier's sort of market position they've taken um, for whatever reason. That's why you see some variation. Thank you very much. I mean, we've gone over here and there are some more questions, but I'll, I'll remind everybody that uh, you're going to get an email tomorrow. Uh, and in the email are links to a recording, a recording of this presentation. You'll be able to download a PDF of the slides and also uh, Michelle's email address is in there. If you have technical questions, you can follow up with her. Michelle, uh, as usual, a great presentation. I learn something new every time I, I listen to your presentation. Thank Thank you. Thanks for hanging in there, folks. I'm sorry we ran over. Woo. Yeah. Um, so if you do also want more information, you can go to steelscape.com. Uh, again, a reminder, the AIA reporting and the certifications are going to be handled automatically, but allow seven business days for that. You're going to get an email tomorrow about this time, same time, 2.30 Central Time for me, uh, with all this information. And uh, thanks for attending. Uh, we're going to do another webinar on May 19th, and it's going to be on single skin metal siding, the performance and design considerations, and it's presented by AEP SPAN. Um, you can always find the latest information on our webinars at metalarchitecture.com slash 2022 events. Thank you all very much for joining us. Michelle, thank you very much for a great presentation, and everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.